the worst money we ever spent for cruising. The biggest mistakes we have made monetarily. When you're outfitting your boat, you're offered all these little gizmos and gadgets that you can spend your money on, and a lot of them are a waste of money. We have been down the east coast of the US, to the Bahamas, to Bermuda, across the Atlantic Ocean, down the coast of Portugal. We've been a long way, and these are the top 10 regrets that we have when it came to spending money for this trip. So we're gonna list the top 10 things that we have wasted money on, starting with the least wasted, all the way to the most wasted money ever. Number 10. The hard dinghy. We started out with a hard fiberglass dinghy because it was less expensive than an inflatable one. Problem was, it ended up costing us more money in the long run. So the hard dinghy was really, really heavy, really durable, but really heavy. So trying to lift that thing out of the water was a huge production, and that ended up causing us to tow it a lot more than we should, and then it got swamped one time in a following sea and sank. Lifting it up also meant that we had to lift it up with a pulley system, an elaborate pulley system with our boom, and it inevitably swung into the deck of the boat, swung into the side of the boat. It bashed into a lot of stuff and it ruined the paint job on our top sides. So in the end, we suggest just starting with the soft inflatable dinghy. It's lighter, it's easier to maneuver, and it's really fast to just blow it up when you need to go to shore. And you can even do patch jobs if something happens to it. Number nine. The hand reel. So a lot of people hold fishing at very high importance when it comes to long-term cruising because you're not always able to store enough fresh food for an entire Atlantic crossing or Pacific crossing. Therefore, fishing becomes very important when it comes to getting fresh, good food. So we thought, let's do it. Let's get a hand reel. And that's gonna be the thing that takes up the least amount of space and is the least expensive so that we can catch fish. How many fish did we catch? We caught two fish over two years. And the hand reel ultimately ended up breaking. Uh, it buckled in a place that we just couldn't get it to unbuckle and it became instantly useless. We had no way of fishing. Number eight. Crop speed anti-fouling paint. So this is a new fangled paint that is not poisonous and so slippery that nothing can stick to it. So when they market it, they tell you if you move your boat frequently and yada yada yada, nothing will stick to it and it'll stay clean and all is perfect. The truth is, even though we sail pretty much every day and you know constantly moving, that sucker grew a lot of stuff. So the leading edges of the propeller, stuff inevitably nicks it or, or something happens and then you start growing crud right on the edge of the propeller and it's, it's so annoying. And then you can't scrape it, you can't scrub it because you'll scratch it and then you'll grow more things. So we currently just covered the propeller with bottom paint and that's been working a lot better. And being how that stuff is like 400 bucks for a tiny tin, for it to then not really work is really annoying. So that was 400 bucks that we could have ultimately saved, which is a very significant amount when your budget is 500 bucks for one month. Number seven. GoPro sessions. This one might only apply to someone like us who is actually doing a YouTube channel uh, in order to make money while cruising. The GoPro sessions uh, we thought would be very useful because they're very small, compact cameras that are extremely easy to use. They're pretty much a GoPro without the GoPro part. It's just the lens and this little tiny box behind it. So they fit everywhere, you can't hurt them. They're, they're marketed as the ultimate action cam because they're, they're perfect. But since they don't have any things to them, there's no screen, there's no nothing, all you get are error beeps. It doesn't tell you why, you have no idea what's going on, it just won't work all the time. It's really annoying. And you have to hook them up to a PC or something like that to figure out what's going on. So we started out by buying two GoPro sessions and one GoPro. 
and we very quickly realized that we only used the GoPro Hero 5. Uh, we never used the sessions because they wouldn't always work, they didn't always record, and it wasn't easy to tell when they were or weren't working. So we very quickly realized that that was an incredible waste of money and we sold them for half of what we paid for them on Craigslist. Number six. The Davids. When I first bought this boat, my plan was to go cruising, and every cruising boat you see has davits on the transom holding a dinghy. So I got the davits, and I had a dinghy, and it was a nightmare. The davits I bought were the cheaper ones at around $1,000. They were really annoying because a couple problems. When you're actually offshore, having davits, having a dinghy hang in the davits is actually a huge risk because if you have a big boarding wave, it fills your dinghy like a giant bathtub all that weight's just gonna rip the davits right off your boat, and then now you have no dinghy, you have no davits, and you have holes in your boat. You spend all that money for davits that you then, when you're actually out there, can't be using. Then the other problem is the dinghy would always bump, bump into the transom, and it was just such a pain, and then anything back there couldn't exist because the davits were in the way. The big problem with davits as well is that you can't have a monitor wind vane and davits, so the davits quickly went away as soon as we got the monitor wind vane. <laughs> Number five. The fisherman anchor. The fisherman anchor is good for anchoring in rocks and weeds. Well, if you're a smart anchorer, you will not anchor in rocks ever uh, for a multitude of reasons, but the end result being we never used our fisherman anchor. <laughs> We got it because we thought we needed to represent all the different types of bottoms with our anchors, but the reality of the situation is that anytime you're anchoring in rock, it's iffy, it's a risk, um, even with a fisherman anchor, even with the proper anchor. And so if you can avoid it, if at all possible, never anchor with a rocky bottom. That meant that our fisherman anchor simply stayed on the deck collecting uh, rust and stubbing toes and just being altogether a terrible hindrance on the deck for a long time until we finally bit the bullet and gave it away. I bought the anchor at a consignment shop, so I got it for really cheap because that anchor new sells for well over $1,000. I spent around $70, and that anchor is now in its proper resting place as a lawn ornament on the yard of one of our friends. Number four. Mildred, our light air main. So on days like today when there is absolutely no wind, we put up our light air sails and we have two of them. We have Dill, our drifter, who is awesome. And then we also have a light air mainsail, which we named Lady Mildred, which was a full normal main simply made out of ripstop nylon, the same material they make a spinnaker out of. And it cost a little under a thousand dollars. That sail, it attached at three points. So you had the clue, the tack, and the head. It wasn't actually attached to the mast. It was a free-flying sail simply held in position by the mast and boom. When you're using it, you're probably going downwind. And when you decide you need to take it down, it's because the wind is building. Now all of a sudden, you have a spinnaker, so to speak, behind your mast, fouling into your spreaders, making a huge mess as the wind is building. That means that we only put her up if we know the conditions are gonna be right to also take her down later. But usually, that means that we're expecting wind to come. So if we're expecting wind to come, we're not gonna put her up. So we have used her maybe twice. It was a good idea originally, simply because we don't have a diesel motor, so we don't have any form of propulsion if the winds are really light. So we loved our drifter so much that we thought, let's get a mainsail to match the drifter uh, for these instances when our electric motor just wouldn't be able to give us the propulsion through the water that we need. It's such a pain to put Mill up and take her down that we just never do it. So yeah, that's why she was ultimately a pretty big waste of money. Number three flexible solar panels. Our main source of power is through solar panels. 
and we didn't really want to bite the bullet and get giant solar panels like the ones we have right now. So we ended up getting four flexible solar panels for just under $200 each. We soon realized that that was a huge mistake. So they say that you can step on the solar panels, you can walk on them, all that business. You can fold them, sit on them. You cannot. They are so delicate. If you step on them or anything, the cells crack and they stop working. So naturally, since they are flexible solar panels, they sat on our deck and we stepped on them. Yeah, we killed them really fast. When we bought them, we thought these are gonna be such a great idea, we should carry spares. So we've been carrying these spares for a long time and then we decided, you know, we hate them so much and they take up so much space in our quarter berth as spares, let's put them on the deck to die sooner and get some power in the meantime. So we're currently using the last of our flexible solar panels for as long as it is that they last. Number two. Laminated full batten main, Marge. When it comes to sailcloth materials, the ultimate sailcloth is not actually cloth. It's laminated mylar with little uh, high-tech fibers that run through it and it's 3D printed to be amazing. These sails will never stretch. They will hold their shape from the day they're made until the day they die, which is usually about seven years. And when they die, it's a catastrophic death. I mean, the thing just like falls apart. But until then, you have a perfect sail. And then adding full battens to it means that you get as big a roach as possible and just all the good things of a sail. But you also get a ton of bad things, which is why this became a $10,000 regret. The laminated sail is a very high-tech engineered machine. The fibers are spun perfectly to take the forces and spread them out between the head, the tack, and the clue. So you have all these cool fibers that run and it's a really neat design. But the fibers are run and then sandwiched in the mylar and there is no changing them. So if in the future you decide you want to add a reef or you want to do anything, you cannot, that sail is finished. The second big issue were the battens. The battens get hooked on everything. They get hooked on your lazy jacks, they get hooked on your shrouds, like they were the biggest headache in that sail. And then the other issue, to make the sail last a little longer, we had it coated with taffeta coating. So your average laminated sail lasts between two to three years. If it's got taffeta coating, it lasts about seven years. The taffeta coating just chafes through anyway and then the fibers start spraying out and the fibers are awful and <laughs> if you get like if you prick your finger on them it itches so much like it was just it you was you don't the worst. even need to prick your finger on them it's just touching them lightly yeah just touching those fibers <laughs> lightly it's like fiberglass into your hand it's so annoying so we actually got rid of marge right before we took this huge sailing adventure and replaced her with Monty, who is a battenless tambark main. And we have been sailing for two years uh, with Monty and have no regrets. We really appreciate the fact that there are no more battens in our lives. And finally, number one, our greatest monetary regret. Our electric autopilot. There are so many things wrong with the electric autopilot. The biggest being the enormous cost. It was $10,000 and we attempted to use it once. So the unit itself isn't 10,000, but by the time you get all the gizmos that go to it and then install it and everything all put together, it was 10 grand at the end. It uses so much power that we turned it on once to do the, the testing and calibration of it, and it used so much power that we had to shut it down, and we have never used it since. We were never able to move fast enough for it to actually properly calibrate, and we have even spoken to other people who have the same autopilot, and even for them, it tends to overcorrect uh, constantly, so it would be, and it's loud when it does, so it's like it never would just like chill in a straight spot. We had that autopilot because at the time we had a diesel engine and our thought was 
we could, when we're motoring, we could run the autopilot and it was supposed to be able to tie into a wind gauge sensor and then to our chart plotter and all those things. And then it was gonna be really awesome because you could plot in where you wanted to go and then the autopilot would actually follow that path, even though there were turns in it. Really awesome, it never worked. <laughs> Uh, I could never get them to talk to each other, even though it was the NM, NEMA 2000, never worked. So now our wind point that we paid about $700 for is a fancy thing that we look at to see which way the wind is blowing. And the uh, thing that is the display for the unit, we don't look at it, it's been covered since we put it on because we never use it. and. That's it. Now it is actually sitting, not even attached to the rudder post. It's zip tied out of the way. That way it's just not annoying. Because even if we didn't use it, it was just so much drag on the steering to turn the wheel that the helm felt really heavy. So it was actually really hard for us to hand steer because we had to be like pushing this piston actuator all the time. So in the end, that became an enormous, enormous waste of money. And it's really just not practical if you are full-time cruising long-term on a sailboat because it takes up so much power and energy and it just and it doesn't work nearly as well as the monitor wind vane that we ended up installing in its place so that's why that was our number one biggest waste of money <laughs> and our number one regret so I hope that this video has helped you a little bit uh, if you're planning to start a life of cruising or if you have already started a life of cruising and were thinking about purchasing any of these really immense things. Um, and if you have any huge monetary regrets that you have, we would love to hear what they are, um, both to help us in the future not to buy them and to help the other viewers of this channel so please list your biggest regrets in the comments section down below thanks so much for watching be sure to like subscribe and share this video with your friends and if you'd like to follow our journey in real time on a map receive postcards from our ports of call and messages directly to the boat, you can go ahead and become a patron using the link in the description down below.